just been projecting. I, I, it sounded like I was on. Thank you. So we have two of our panelists who are on their way. One just walked in, yay. And the other one is um, will be joining us and will come up uh, to the stage at that point in time. But at this point, I'm going to, and um, Reverend Gwen, good. Why don't you rest? <laughs> you just go ahead and rest. You, could, could you, you put out a lot. You put out a lot. So at this point, we're going to invite up our panelists and our moderator. Thank you. Give, give, us, give us a round of applause. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord again, everybody. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. I'm from a Pentecostal church, so that's how everybody gets started. Praise the Lord, saints. <laughs> that's how we do testimony service. Anyway, greetings from Detroit, Michigan, Motown itself. My name is Minister Kelly Lee. You all can call me Kelly. I go by Kelly. Kelly is wonderful. Um, but I, am, I have uh, been in ministry for a very long time. Pastors are, parents are pastors. Grandmother is a pastor. Uh, and I know that uh, it's been, I just came out to my family on last year, and it's been a wonderful coming out. God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. I'm, God, I'm glad God gave me the strength and the courage to fight. But it wasn't much of a fight. It went over very well. My parents are very perceptive people, spiritually perceptive people. So God was good to me in that way. But it's not always good. Amen. And so I am so glad to be here in an LGBT family. I'm so glad to be here at City of Refuge, Bishop Flunder. I've been checking y'all out every week on the City of, of Refuge YouTube channel. Uh, so that's just a little bit about me. I, I pursued... Uh, meeting Reverend Dr. Stringfellow at Metropolitan Community Church because he is an activist back where we are. He is on the Economic Chamber of Commerce and he does a lot of work in the city of Ferndale which has a high population of LGBT people. And I said, I got to meet this man. I got to meet the man of God. And I am so glad that he invited me along to this Souls of Fire um, conference. And so with that being said, I am going to put this session in the context of a television show. Amen. So I want you to know we are at SAF TV. Okay. This is not just souls of fire. Let's protect 10 years down the line. We're trying to reach a whole community of people. If we are 10% of 300 million, that means we're 30 million strong. Amen. So put your hands together for 30 million strong. <laughs> And we've got 30 million viewers that are here today. So let's introduce our panel today. My name is your, your host is Kelly Lee. Welcome to SAF TV. Uh, to my far left, we have Reverend Dr. Stringfellow. And I'm going to give you some of his credentials. This is not everything. It's not all in competency. But Do Reverend Dr. Roland Stringfellow serves as the Director of Ministerial Outreach and Coordinator of the African American Roundtable of the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies in religion and ministry. In 2005, Roland was ordained with the Metropolitan Community Church, and in 2006, he earned his Master of Divinity from the Pacific School of Religion with a certificate in religion and sexuality. And now we know that he is on his way to his doctorate. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's Reverend Roland Stringfellow. To his immediate right, we have uh, Reverend Pastor Cedric Harmon as an ordained pastor affiliated with the National Baptist and Missionary Baptist Churches. Cedric Harmon served as a religious organizer for Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. And for 13 years, he recruited and trained clergy from around the country to provide legislative testimony about issues of religion and government. And there's one other thing about a pastor that we don't know, or maybe you all know, and I'm learning, is that he is also a wonderful facilitator of the Many Voices or Executive Director for a, of Many Voices. And I have been checking his channel out as well. So put your hands together for the Many Voices <laughs> Ministry. To his immediate right, we have Reverend MacArthur Flournoy. He is a he's a theologian and author and preacher uh, as the director for faith based faith partnerships and mobilization for the human rights campaign. MacArthur served as the faith director for Mary Landers for Marriage Equality. Reverend Flournoy has more than 30 years of nonprofit management experience, also serving local government, state, and federal governments. 
Mar MacArthur voluntarily serves as the National Minister of Public Policy for the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, an international coalition of open and affirming ministries where the presiding bishop is Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder. Let's give our hand, give, put a round of applause together for Reverend Flunder. <laughs> and to the immediate right of him, we have uh, Reverend Rodney McKenzie Jr., who is the faith work director at the LGBTQ Task Force, is an out person of faith, a community organizer, and a reverend. Over the last 13 years, he's worked for organizations fighting for grassroots political power in marginalized communities. From being a field organizer at the task force in 2002 to most recently being the spiritual director and co-creator of the Expansion Church, his work fo focuses on the intersection of community organizing and radical spirituality in the public square. Let's put our hands together for Minister Rodney McKenzie. Now, I have not read their entire bios. I would please reference you to this, this wonderful program that tells in entirety all the things that these wonderful men who are on the panel does. And then what, later on, we're going to have uh, the good Minister Gwen and Zan West join us as well. So let's get started with this particular session of SAF TV. Uh, we, are, we are here because we know that the LGBT community is expanding and is growing. We're, we're known of 30 million strong, but we're sure that there's more out there. And I, I'm going to start off with Reverend Flournoy because I am, I, everywhere I go, when I say, hey, I'm going to go talk to Reverend Flournoy from Human Rights Campaign, they're like, oh, gosh, are you really? So I'm like, I'm starting with him first. Because marriage equality passed last year in June of 2006. Often people feel that there is nothing else that can be done from a legislative perspective. When we're talking about policy, when we're talking about protection for LGBT people. But Reverend Flournoy, the first question goes to you today. Can you explain to us and tell us a little bit more about legislation and policy as it pertains to the LGBT community? What are some other things that we should be pushing in our own circles, in our own neighborhoods that you're doing there at HRC? Sure, well, uh, one of the things I think is, is this thing on? Cat, stop, stop. Yes. Okay, so one of the things I think is important to know is that in 28 states that you can still be fired for being an LGBT person. You can get married today, go to your job this afternoon, and be terminated from employment. Now, that's an economic justice issue right off the bat. We know that the greatest number of people that are parenting children are people of color that are LGBT. And to be more precise, it happens to be black lesbians, family, headed household in the South. And they face the greatest danger in terms of a termination of employment. So that it's not only an issue of LGBT equality, it's an issue of economic justice. The other thing has to do with housing. In 28 states, you could be turned away from housing simply for being identified or suspected of, I don't know how they prove it, of being like, I remember I was meeting with a bunch of clergy in Florida, and one of the uh, ministers said to me after I was talking with them, and he said, well, let me just ask you a question. Are you a practicing homosexual? And that's what he asked me. Are you a practicing homosexual? Wow. To which I had to just be, get quiet, and I didn't know how to tell this man that I was board certified. So uh, <laughs> what I said within my, within my professional capacity is that I am convinced that uh, Jesus loves all and that I'm there to speak on behalf of that justice issue. But when it comes back to the issue of housing and legislation, those are two criti critical things that we need to look at. And so therefore, we're putting forth the Equality Act in collaboration with our LGBT partners across the country. This will be the largest piece of federal legislation. But, but let me just stop for a moment. It's not just about LGBT. I don't know about you, but I don't have the luxury of just talking about sexual orientation or gender identity. As a person of color who is, happens to be Latino and black, as a father of five, I'm equally concerned about voters' rights, voter suppression, racial justice, employment, school loans, housing, predatory lending. So I raise those points to simply say this, is that I think that we are at a pivotal point in this movement where we must queer justice movements wherever we go. It's not an option, we must. And I think it's incumbent upon us to be able to speak in terms of definable, measurable, outcomes that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the outcomes then must be that every person must have a right to vote. Absolutely. 
And, I, and so that's where my heart and soul lies. I believe that in the work that we're doing as an organization, it's absolutely around the Equality Act, housing, and um, job security. But on a larger scale, particularly th this year, what we don't understand is that if we do not vote this year, we are in danger of losing state legislatures across this country that will, be, that will disproportionately impact poor people, black people, brown people, differently able people. And so how do people get involved with the legislative plot process? Are, is it just enough that we donate to HRC? Or are you guys look HRC looking for people to sign up for any? Tell us a little bit well, more Well, I think that. it's important that we give where we are, that we start right where we are. For instance, the uh, NAACP, some exciting work has been happening there, and it's, been, it's come with a struggle. I want to let you know that they have an LGBT task force that I'm gifted to sit on, but the NAACP, until last year, even though that, that task force has been in existence for, and, and, and uh, Dr. Hendricks, you were there uh, when you facilitated one of the task force meetings a couple of years ago. They refused to put, publicize the task force was even meeting. Wow. They refused to put it in the program book, and so you had to be virtually a cartographer to find out how to find the workshop. But what if we all joined up and, uh, with the NAACP, join existing structures, the National Action Network? The Reverend Al Sharpton uh, has just convened the National LGBT Alliance, and so I'm working with Bishop Flunder. He's asking me to head it to put together a set of national strategies. There are branches all across the nation. Why aren't we members of the National Action Network? And so I'm saying those are just two examples, but even I love those bro sisters and brothers that are part of the eight largest denominations that are all African American, that are members of the Congress and National Black Churches. All eight have anti-LGBT policies. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I don't need to call names, but you can imagine. Um, but what about those sisters and brothers that sit in those pews? Mm -hmm. To me, I used to think that if you sit there that you had internalized homophobia, and I, that while that may be true for some, I equally believe there are those that are there that, that are positioned to do a critical work. And so I think it's being right where you are and being willing to use your voice for change. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Put your hands together one more time for that. <laughs> Let's move along to Brother Rodney McKenzie. Tell us a little bit more, Rodney, about the work that you do at uh, the National LB LGBT Task Force and how you serve uh, pastors and congregations there. Yeah, I, um, I'm really just, I want to thank, uh, thank you for what you just said. I was really moved. You know, I, I, I'm, um, you know, a couple of things. First of all, I, I really, I think about James Baldwin right now who said that he had to leave the church to preach the gospel. And that's, that's really how I really have gotten started in this work. I, I actually had a congregation in New York City called Expansion Church. It was a 300-person church. We met every Sunday in Chelsea. We first started in Chinatown. We moved into Chelsea. We had, it was a majority uh, people of color, maybe 60% LGBTQ. And what I, what I realized as I was doing my church was that, that actually what we needed wasn't just another church. We needed a movement. Right. And, and so I was really struggling with what does it mean if we create a faith movement that recognized and realized that our work was to get off our knees mm -hmm. and do something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so what does it mean for us to build a movement where we reclaimed faith, where we reclaimed the moral language, and we said that because of our faith, because of our faith traditions, that you cannot discriminate against anyone. Mm -hmm. And so the work that I'm doing at the task force is really, I'm really interested in queering faith but also really bringing faith to the LGBTQ movement. So what does it mean if LGBTQ people could come out again as people of faith? Where we have been traumatized, we've been harmed in churches and in faith communities, and though, we are still the ones running and leading these churches. We know faith, we understand faith. Faith is in our bones. Faith is something that we own as LGBTQ people of faith. And so my work is about querying this idea that faith is one place and organizing is in a separate place. And we know from our communities, people of color communities, that faith and organizing have always been together. 
But for some reason, in many movements, we have attempted to make faith one place and organizing a completely different an area. And so what I've, been, what I've done and what, what's happened at the task force is that my old position was the faith work director. I'm now the director of the Academy for Leadership and Action, where I'm responsible for a team of eight people who are organizers. And what we do is we go on the ground and we help faith communities realize that the way we build our churches, the way we transform politics is by engaging in the political system. It's by actually coming out as people of faith. It's about telling people of faith, going pew to pew, and having conversations about who we are as LGBTQ people of faith, telling our journey stories, and pushing this quote unquote right to realize that they're not right at all. That actually we are people of faith and we can claim faith and that what's happening in this world right now is not only systematically evil, it's systematic sin. And so what happens if people of faith began to reclaim moral language and talked about abortion, talked about these ridiculous bathroom bills that are happening across this, the country, talked about immigration, talked about voting rights, not from a political place, but talked about it from a moral, from a faith place. What would happen if we could transform that faith narrative where it's no longer just these um, evangelical uh, anti-gay folks speaking, but it's evangelical LGBTQ people speaking, where it's evangelical people of faith who love God and who understand that God calls for justice making. How would that change and transform our whole system? And so I guess my work is really about expanding our theological imagination on what is possible. Like what does it mean for us as people of faith to engage radically? Um, and a part of that, I think, is to confront not only black churches about their homophobia, but it's also to confront these churches on their anti-blackness and their anti-people of color attitudes. And so we have a lot of work to do, but we can do it from a faith frame. And that's what my work is about, is about being on the ground, teaching folks to reclaim faith. It's about doing conferences. It's about providing resources to people who normally don't get resources so that we can do smart organizing from a faith frame. And I think that's awesome. I actually went to your website, the um, National LGBT uh, Task Force actually has a component that they merged with called the uh, Institute for Welcoming Resources that actually has trainings about how to introduce LGBT issues to your local congregation. So if you're in a congregation that wants to be open and more sensitive to LGBT, more affirming, it actually trains you. It, there's campaigns and material that you read as a study group, as a training group. How do you introduce it to your congregation? So that's pretty awesome. But even if I build upon that, um, Reverend Herman, you have uh, many <coughs> voices, and I think many voices is a, a good reflection of a lot of what um, Rodney has already shared with that because it is literally trying to help people see that LGBT people are people of faith. Why don't you talk a little bit more about that, expand on it. Thank you. So one of the, one of the great things about the work that Many Voices does is that the work that we do is not just ours. We don't own it. Mm. It's collaborative work. So I work with every one of these people on this stage. We're not operating in our silos separately, but we are collaboratively seeking to change this world. If there's one thing that will cause us to fail, it is remaining divided. Absolutely. Even over funding. Yeah. Yeah. Especially over funding. Speak. And so Souls of Fire is a collaborative effort between uh, CLGS and the African American Roundtable and many voices. That's a wonderful thing. Because I know that you know that if you are a member of First AME <laughs> and you have a pastor friend who's the pastor of Mount Pisgah Baptist <laughs> and you go to dinner with the local pastor of St. Paul CME we actually cross over the denominational lines. And if pastors don't do it, members definitely do it. It's one of those things that most people, uh, many people didn't realize. So if you're working in the black church, people say, well, could you just get 
Well, if a person is a pastor or a religious leader and they speak, folks don't know what denomination they're affiliated with, but they believe that they speak for all black Christians. And so you'll see some clergy who are in oppositional positions stand up and speak as though they speak for all black clergy. And the media doesn't know the difference. And sometimes we don't know the difference. The other thing I would say is the work that we do within congregations and with religious leaders is not just religious leaders. The second part of our work is to work with black LGBTQ people themselves. Story is the most effective way to really make difference. So highlighting the voices of black LGBTQ Christian folk or people of faith Mm. themselves. So our video projects do that. And then we have written materials. So I want to say that these two materials that are in your folders are not the result of me sitting somewhere saying, let me figure out something to write. These are based on questions and conversations and coffees and engagements and seminar conversations and breakout groups where people literally asked these questions. And then we went back and wrote the books based on what the community asked for. Hmm. One of the things that happens is often black LGBTQ people are invisibilized in the movement. You better speak it. I'll say that in the movement. Mm. movement. So the movement doesn't look like us. Mm. Having faces that look like us on covers makes a huge difference for our community to understand we're talking about our community. The other thing that we get to do is we get to imagine in this work. So we were imagining and wondering what would it look like to bring together evangelical Christians to talk about LGBTQ issues in a private setting to do some training and skills building, and then invite those that were willing to engage in a public statement. That's going to happen next week at Union Seminary. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. I do not believe that we are so gifted with all that we have for nothing. So I'm gonna quote someone very close to me. My Aunt Martha Ann. Y'all don't know Martha Ann, but I knew Martha Ann. (laughs) My Aunt Martha Ann would use the term in moments like this one right here. She would say, I reckon we ought to get busy being rather than just doing something to look good. Mm. And I reckon we ought to get busy being rather than just doing something to look good. We have to actually model the world that we imagine. And that is one of the things about being in this space. Absolutely. Who could have imagined such a space until we started being such a space. That's awesome. Uh, So uh, along with that, because you just said a lot, you just said a lot because uh, a lot that I see, a lot of progress in the LGBT community, I see in more Caucasian uh, more Caucasian congregations than than African American congregations. United Church of Christ. Uh, we also have the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which is about it boasts about four million uh, in that particular organization, uh, and they're also moving uh, progressively on LGBT, as well as the Metropolitan Community Church, which uh, is about twenty thousand strong. And uh, Reverend. Uh, Stringfellow, can you tell us a little bit more about MCC? Because it is the only denomination that I know of besides TFAM. But it has uh, 20 to 30 years of history, and it has organized itself just to serve LGBTQ. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about MCC, the work that it does, the work that you do, and how do we get pastors to turn on to to LGBT, um, the LGBT-sensitive issues? Maybe we won't convince them theologically, but maybe we can go at it a different route, just to open dialogue. If we can at least get them talking, that's better than not talking. Absolutely. You know, I would say, and actually, um, MCC is 47 years old and getting ready to um, celebrate its 50th, coming up in a couple of years. And uh, when MCC was founded by Reverend Troy Perry, who was outed, outed, 
um, of his Pentecostal church. And it, it really serves the power of, one, the spirit, but of movement building because he had this vision to simply have groups in his living room. And from the living room, it the, you know, blossomed into the um, international denomination it is today. And I, we're, we're at a juncture. We're getting ready to have our general conference in Victoria, Canada, uh, coming up this um, summer. And we are looking at our statement of faith. And we're also looking at our future, where do we go from here? And I think many organizations and institutions that have been committed to LGBT justice work, after marriage equality, then what? Right. And now that you can go to the Lutheran church or the Methodist church and hold your partner's hand right. without being, you know, shamed from the pulpit, right. then what? Right. And I believe part of what our mandate for the world should be is that it's great that you can go down the street and hold your partner's hand at such and such a church, but will you receive the type of healing and teaching of how to heal from the spiritual violence mm. that many of us have endured before we got to an inclusive space like a metropolitan community church. And I believe that that is a um, prophetic heritage mm. that the MCC has and should step into. And we're going to nominate our next leader, our moderator for the denomination at this general conference. And that is something that I'm really am hoping the MCCs are, the body that will come to vote will have the wherewithal to vote for this person who can take us to that next level, not to continue to um, you know, slide in back because we've always done things the way we've, we've done them. Because the heritage of MCCs mm. is much like the heritage of many um, gay places like bars and bathhouses and bookstores and so forth that um, the windows are, are blotted out. Mm -hmm. There's no address or placard on the door to let you know what exactly is on the inside. And that really is where, how um, the MCCs were really birthed. And that is nothing, that, that, that's not a, a past that we are ashamed of. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of our DNA. However, we don't live in that type of world or community anymore. Even in the more, most rural of places that are not affirming, that's not where we are. And that's not where we should stay. So I believe that coming out of those shadows mm -hmm. and to say that we are indeed an affirming space that's open to all people. And as we look at what does welcoming actually mean, Right. And that it should be broader than just simply inviting in the LGBTQI, you know, folks, but those straight allies and 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 other folks to come in to um, not so much look like everyone else, because I think we're going to be still uniquely queer. We we, we talked about this rainbow in our DNA, <laughs> and, and 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 that I think should always be, but. As we look at the rainbow, and, and many of you here are familiar with um, the vast majority of what MCC congregations look like, which are predominantly Caucasian, how then also does that welcoming look like in terms of race and ethnicity? And how can we look beyond these core issues of LGBT equality to truly be intersectional with other issues that are out there impacting marginalized communities? Absolutely. And I believe that hopefully that is part of our future of where we're heading and where we're going and that this new uh, moderator may help us achieve that. Great, great. One more thing uh, for all the panelists, and I'm sure there'll be a few other things, and if there's any Q&A, please just lift your hand and uh, we, we'll, come, we'll bring the mic to you. But one more thing, and we can start from the right and work our way this way, uh, starting with you, Brother Rodney. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, how to get pastors and if, if you can't get pastors, maybe families, uh, open to 
to be sensitive about the LGBT issue in this way, in this context, because I find often dealing with people and dealing with pastors, I can't get them on LGBT, but I can get them on teen suicide programs, mm -hmm. teen suicide prevention. Uh, that's always a very, um, that's something that'll get right at the heart of Jesus. I don't care if you, you apostolic, kojic, Pentecostal, people want to know what they can do to, to, to ebb, to cut off the, the teen suicide that we see. Yeah. Brother Ronnie, can you tell me a little bit more about ministering to young people as they're coming out in their identity, their lgbt -ness. Uh How do we, how do we, how do we get that conversation going in Pentecostal churches? I know you have a lot of experience with congregations, and then we'll work our way this way because I feel like that's a platform that we can all agree, no matter where you are, no, how, no matter how right, how left, uh, that it's something that we need to serve. Yeah. I mean, I have a little bit to say, but I, I know that I'm going to be looking to my uh, to Roland and Cedric, sometimes known as Cedric, but sometimes known as Cedric, um, to, to speak on this. But, I mean, there's a part of me that when I hear that question, I sometimes get so angry mm -hmm. because a part of me is curious, what, hap what, what will it take for LGBTQ folks to stop giving our money to pastors right. who do not support us right. and who do not love us and do, who do not care for us? You know, when I closed my church, I went to a church uh, in, in Harlem that is a well-known church. I will not say its name. And, but the church was open, allegedly. But they never spoke about me. Huh. They never named me. And for me, that is harmful and painful. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I wonder what will it take for LGBTQ folks, and specifically I'm talking about in particular um, people of color who are LGBTQ, to to go on strike, to, to, to write to the church and say, this is how much money I used to tie, mm. <laughs> and I'm no longer tying it. Mm. But I wonder if there, is a, if there is some community organizing strategies that we can take that shut some of these places down. Because there's a way in which we have agencies that will take care of to make sure if you eat something wrong, a restaurant can't stay open. But why is it? That, so, that's, that a place that's supposed to nourish your soul and is killing you and depleting you uh, is allowed to stay open. And I think there's something to be, I think we have to challenge and shift that. But I think as an organizer, I think one of the things that we can do is that we can begin to organize ourselves and say that this is no longer acceptable. And what does it, ha what does it mean when we, we become bold and share our stories with people in the pews about who we are and about who we love and about how we know ourselves to be. Like, what does it mean if we begin to organize some of the Bible studies that Emoja does, some of the resources that Many Voices has, and we say, let's, we're going to come together and talk this through and talk about this. And what would it look like for us to begin to organize meetings with the pastor, the first lady, the mama of the church, and begin to have those conversations that we're here and the reason that we're leaving is because your messages and your sermons are not metaphorically killing us. They're literally killing us. So you're talking about a mass exodus. I think it's a mass exodus. I want to see how many people in here think that we ought to see, we ought to see a mass, <laughs> <laughs> mass exodus. And, I, I, and the thing about it is I, I know <laughs> that it, it is, you know, because we have been entertained, because the church has meant so much for us, Right, because in white gay communities, we are not fully accepted. I get that, like that's real, right? But these churches that are supposed to be the place where we feel at home and we're, fed, we're supposed to be fed, there are so many of us who are silently suffering in pews and paying for the lights, paying for the BMWs, paying for all of these things for the churches and the pastors to have. So I think there's an organizing spirit that we can create that pushes the pastors that pushes the congregation, and then we begin to organize because we know who we are in the churches. And we begin to say, let's have a drink, let's, let's, let's meet, let's start talking, and then push the church to do something different. So, uh, Reverend Foreigner, that's a good point. So that's a good point. So on a national level, with all the different denominations that you work with at HRC, do you, do you see, do you, is there any way to organize collaboratively for something like that, a push to, that, that LGBT can somehow start to, to funnel into one 
I see it happening every single day. Okay. And I see it happening in different ways, not in the way that I would go about it, mm -hmm. and not in the way that I would consider to be a mass exodus, but I see acts of defiance every single day in various denominations in various ways. I see it through the querying of the music, the querying of the text. I see it in people choosing when to tithe and when not to tithe. I see people when the pastor's preaching something stupid, folks will respond in a way that they let them know that's something stupid. Right. The other thing that I've learned is not to put so much emphasis on the pastor because I've learned something. The power is not in the pulpit, the power is in the pews. And so that's where I place a lot of my energy in. And what I've learned is that we have taken, and I agree with my brother, we've taken the role of pastor and made it almost mythic. That that's where all the, and, and with all due reverence for those who serve us in the role of pastors, I've also recognized that to some extent it has become pathological. Mm -hmm. And we did that to ourselves. But I want to make a different point. Yes, sir. That if you do not love yourself, if you do not value yourself, and if you believe that your only source is that particular church, and you convince yourself that you are doing an excuse of a behind whooping every single Sunday, mm -hmm. then that's where you will go. And if you're hurting, and I, I do get hurt, I get woundedness, I understand that. And so that I don't want to blame those that are hurt because they've been victimized by an institution for not getting up and walking out of that institution because I understand them to be hurt. But I do think that there needs to be, and I want to speak to this, I think there needs to be a degree in our, in our advocacy and in our movement that embraces mental health hmm. and healing. And I want to speak that into this space. Mm -hmm. Because it kills us through all manner of addictions, be it sex, be it drugs, be it alcohol, be it food, be it work, be it exercise, love, relationship, whatever it is. And so I think that it, what I do see is people uh, challenging these norms. I don't see it in, in the proportion that I would like to. I really don't. But I do see it. And, and so what I try to do is walk with organizations, walk with congregations, walk with pastors. And the last thing I want to say is that the currency of, of my work, and I think all of us know this, particularly come from African descended families, we want to know when you come to our house, who's your mother? Who's your father? <coughs> you know, where you from? Who your people? And you just don't come. When you came to my house, you just didn't go to the refrigerator. You sat in the living room. Right. And right. my parents would want to know who were your parents. Absolutely. And you abided by the rules of the house. And then, they, and then you might be invited to dinner. And so there was a protocol and there was a way. And what was that all about? That was about relationship. Mm -hmm. And so everything that I do, the, the, if there's anything that I've learned, it's all about relationship. I can work with people and I work with people who completely disagree with me, but I'm in a relationship with them. And I refuse to walk away from that table. And I think that what we have to do is how to value relationship and how to build, build that into mm -hmm. our movement so that we can stay in relationship with people where we hold dissimilar viewpoints, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it does. Then awesome word, awesome word. So then, Reverend Harmon, tell me a little bit more, because it looks like the, the trigger here is, is in our community, is healing mm -hmm. and, and mental health and restoration, getting, getting folks trans, as they're transitioning, keeping them whole to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. But when you have a lack of LGBT-sensitive churches out there, then, then where where do people go? I mean, if you don't have a church that you can go to in your immediate community, <coughs> uh, then, then where do you go to get healing? Where do you go to get LGBT leadership? Where do you go? I mean, online is also available, but I mean, you know, how do people progress and process their transition? So I, I want to say that often we discount our own power and our capacity to create what we need. Awesome. We are of a community that made ways out of no way. We are of community and a history that our liberation was worth everything, including our death. Hmm. We have a history and a tradition that is ours, rooted and grounded in spirituality, that extends beyond the four walls of any church. And if we would claim that reality, that it's ours, it doesn't belong to you. It's never belonged to you, institution. It's been ours as individuals. And we may 
need community where community did not exist. And as LGBTQ people, we have had ballroom experience Hello. and house parties, <laughs> and we've had church at the club on Sunday evenings when we couldn't go to the real church. Someone would put on some gospel and we get our shout on at the club. We know how to live as exiles, and we know how to be nomadic people that create a tent that fits us. The challenge, however, is when we bring negativity from tradition into the spaces that are supposed to be safe. Yes, sir. Furthermore, I would say that just because we're bi, we're lesbian, we're gay, we're transgender, we're queer does not mean we've done the work to be the best bi, lesbian, gay, queer, transgender person. Mm -hmm. so these resources speak not just to the church institution that harms us, they speak to us because there's some work we need to do internally to be okay with who we are and know how to live into that in healthy, whole, and flourishing ways. Just because I am doesn't mean I know what I need to do to survive. And some of the survival mechanisms I have used are harmful and deleterious, and I need to let go of them once I come to full liberation. So being free has a responsibility with it. And being free means learning how to live free, which is not the same as living enslaved. Right. But often we bring the enslaved mentality into our free spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It also means being vulnerable enough to say, I need external help. Like I need a therapist and I need some medication. Mm -hmm. And I need to be true to taking my medication and visiting my therapist for my health and well-being so that I can serve not only myself but my community. And those are difficult things and require a lot of support. So we need to build networks of support for that to happen. And that may be outside of a church, or it may be in a really, truly affirming church that affirms and celebrates and desires for your full wholeness and thriving. Awesome. Uh, one question for, for, from Reverend uh, Str Stringfellow, uh, and after Reverend Stringfellow, we'll take, we'll take some questions from the audience. What kind of sermons do you think pastors ought to be teaching and ministering to the LGBT community hmm. to ensure they're getting the spiritual content and download to bring healing, to maintain healing uh, as they're progressing through their life? Well, as I interpret your question, you know, it comes to mind, um, who's preaching? You know, is it, is it um, someone who's already affirming or someone who is kind of sitting on that fence and wants to be more inclusive because I believe that, you know, all of us have worked with those types of ministers as well. And, 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 and so rather than really talk about specifics and specific, you know, uh, um, sermons that need to be taught because I believe particularly what all of my colleagues have already said, you know, elements of that, I th that, that go to the healing, I believe that's important. I think before we can even get to the place of the preaching, as even what Cedric was talking about, it's like there has to be this internal change and this mindset that 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 is changed. And I I, I want to tell a, a quick story because I left my fundamental Baptist church and I was reared in the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship Association (FBFA). And so it, it is, you know, just conservative of conservative of conservative of black Baptist. Two weeks ago, I went back to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I'm from, for my pastor's uh, wife's funeral. This is the church that I was seen as the person had two heads and, you know, cast out. And every time I would come around, you know, people would, would laugh and, and literally laugh. And my mother was 
was re remained there, and she was the one who had to endure a lot of the ridicule. But over time, she got from this place of just being this silent person, just taking it, to you're not going to talk about my son. Right. 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 And there was this change that happened. When I went back for my pastor's funeral, and this is, I had not been, and I've seen some of these people since the late 90s, the denominational leaders and so forth. And I was a little nervous. I didn't know how it was going to, you know, be. And I walk in, and people are like, Roland, hey, how are you doing? I mean, very, I mean, people who, I mean, this one brother in particular, who he and I got into a shouting match over scripture. And I was like, all right, hey, brother, how you doing? Yeah, yeah. And I left, immediately left, and he followed. And he really was like, no, I really want to know what's happening. What's going on? I'm telling you that story is because what I believe the change was, was going back to what MacArthur said, it's family, it's relationship, it's kinship. And what I really believe, because it's now my testimony, and again, I've come out of very, very conservative spaces that over time, by us being consistent and not, and choosing to be open and to be out and choosing not to hide and to you know, fade away, but being consistent, I have seen people can't help but to have a, a change of heart. I've seen it in my own family. I've seen it now within my church heritage. And so will my pastor preach a, an inclusive sermon? I don't think so. But I don't know. But, but, but I'll tell you what he did do. I was able to be a pastor to my pastor when I went up to his house and he's sobbing because he's lost his wife and we're crying together. And he welcomed me and needed me at that point. Why did that happen? Not because I went in and I took my curriculum, not because I invited him to some closed door meeting. We had a relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when we all got back together for that funeral, it was family reunion. And I was, I was shocked that I was welcomed back into the fold. And, and, and well, why did that happen? Again, I think because of our testimonies that we keep telling people and showing people back when, you know, we all came out, it was rough. We, we, we paid the price. But I really believe by being that consistent force, hopefully, not, 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 ev not everybody, and, and God bless those who mama and grandmama don't change, but I do believe that many people's perspectives will be broadened when we continuously and consistently tell our story over and over. So, so what I hear from you is that relationship creates the space, the room for change. I believe so. Yeah, I How believe many would agree with that? Yes, relationship yes, yes. creates the room <coughs> for change. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, we're going to switch gears to Q&A. Anybody have any? I am bringing the microphone <laughs> to you. I'll give you your oh, I don't? Okay. Okay, don't need the mic. Because we are recording this, so let's, let's get you on the mic. Oh, for sure. So my question is actually for Reverend Rodney. Um, you mentioned about the mass exit that yeah. we should all just up and do, and that's fine and then, and that's like the happy path to the all for everybody. But what do we do about those people that are queer people who are have this internal homophobic that yeah. they don't even know that they are being ostracized with the subtleness of the pastors that they have? I was, I mean, I can ask that because I wasn't so far removed from that person. Yeah. And when I came to the city of refuge, I've been here like a year, just like in this year, I've grown leaps and bounds, you know, and I'm, I'm like, I can stand on top of the building and just tell everybody <laughs> I'm queer and I'm here. <laughs> but I wasn't always like that. Yeah. And I still have friends that, you know, they think I've lost my mind totally because I'm here. That's right. but, and then, but we all know that's not true. But you know, so what do we do with those people? How do we start to get them to exit the church? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, so I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I had an experience a year ago that changed me. Uh, I, uh, in, in South Carolina, actually in North Carolina, 
a young trans man committed suicide, Brock Brockington committed suicide. And I decided that my job as the faith work director at the time was that I had to go to that funeral. I was like, I am going to that funeral because my work is about the young folks who are, th uh, are his friends and I wanna be there with him. And so when I went to the funeral, my heart was broken by the number of young trans and gender non-conforming folks who were there, who no one cared about, no one could minister to. And I hugged them and I was with them and I, I watched a family struggle with how to talk about their, their son. They didn't know how to talk about it. And what I realized was that my work wasn't theoretical, mm -hmm. that my work was actually work that was critical because people are dying mm -hmm. now. And so actually I think there's a couple of things that we have to do. A, we have to, and those of us who are here, those of us who are in school, those of us who are running organizations, we actually have to ask ourselves, do we really know that people are dying now? Like this isn't, like this is like there's urgency to it, right? And so what does it mean that if we as individuals and as a collective say that the life of every person Every LGBTQ person is really important to us. And so in our specific congregations and churches that we're in, we are speaking life to each other, we're holding each other, we're loving each other, we're teaching each other, we are pushing, th when we hear a sermon that doesn't rub us the right way, we challenge in loving kindness that we challenge it. We begin to ask more questions, we begin to do Bible studies, and we begin to find ways that we go to churches that no one is going to and begin to build the relationships and begin to bring the Bible studies and have the conversations that we can have around what does it mean to be living and what does it mean to be affirming to all people. So I think there's, a, there's work that we each individually can do. And I'm actually really committed to a mass exodus because I actually, I think, because I think there's something about, I wonder what does it mean that right now, the number of people, like churches are declining. And I'm curious about what that's about. Like, what does it mean that there's some things that may be dead and we may need to do a funeral for it? And that's okay. Because I wonder if there's something new that God is calling forth that we are still trying to keep the lights on in institutions that may need to go ahead and die. And so because of that, I wonder, right? I wonder, it's just a wonder, that if we begin to take serious, like, we're hearing things that harm us and we love these people. These are our family members and we love them. I will see you at the picnic, but I may not come this Sunday because I want to support places that actually allow me to flourish in the totality of what God has called me to be. So I think there's some, I think there's multiple things that we can do at once. We can keep doing our tools. We can bring that message uh, more and more. I think we need more of us on TV, on radio. I think we have to have more institutions that are affirming and loving and we support them. I think we can take our ties away. Even if we don't want to leave those churches, what if we tithe less and tithe here? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think there's things that we can do that will shift the paradigm for, for all people. Mm -hmm. uh uh, just, just on that, hold that question. Just on that note, uh, we have Zan West, who is a uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protester, fierce yeah, activist. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about, uh, we're talking about a mass exodus. I know you're in just a little bit late, but we're talking about a mass exodus, which is a type of protest. Uh, tell me, what could we learn from the Black Lives Matter if we wanted to organize something like an, an exodus Sunday? What, what, what do you think BLM could, could offer in terms of strategy? or just um, good characteristics of a good protest? I, I think there's a lot that could be offered, um, primarily organization and what it means to be organized. Um, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott wasn't because a couple people woke up one morning and decided not to get on the bus, right? right? right. It, it was actually organized and it was organized mostly by churches and so I love your idea of a mass exodus. I actually work at a United Methodist Church that I do not tithe to. Um, I've talked to the staff about that I don't give to any homophobic organization so why would I give to that one? Mm -hmm. um, and so I support that idea. Um, but I definitely think um, 
the Black Lives Matters has a lot to offer in terms of what it looks like to um, organize mass protest, mm -hmm. um, to think through messaging, tone, logic, um, things like that. Um, the church also has a lot to offer BLM. Mm -hmm. I think they have a lot to offer each other. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question all the way back to the back, to the far right. Thank you. This is for anyone who would like to answer it. <coughs> My antennas went up when I heard mental health because I work in mental health and I'm going to school to uh, continue that. But um, so I guess to start, I will say that. So Sister Badu famously said that most intellects do not believe in God, but they fear it's just the same. And I, I interpret that uh, in this way. So um, at the center that I work at, I work at an LGBT center, and it mostly serves white uh, LGBT people. And, and that's fine and dandy because um, all queer people um, have endured um, some form of trauma that needs to be dealt with. But I ultimately am not concerned, at least in the use of my mind, body, and spirit with the well-being of white people and white queer people because they have plenty of white people to do that for them. My concern is with uh, queer people of color and people of color and their mental health. And when that came up, I thought about, and I thought about the church historically being the place that mental health happened for the black community. Um, and I think that it actually did it very well because it was our way of doing it mm -hmm. and not the white way of doing it, which is sitting in a room and having a psychiatrist give you a diagnosis out of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is um, overseen by mostly white and mostly male and mostly straight uh, people. And I'm forced to use that in my work, but that is another thing. All this to say, what is, as people of faith and black people of faith, um, do you feel it's still the black church or the black queers church, queer church to uh, job to um, continue the work of mental health? Um, do we move to these historically white institutions of mental health to serve uh, black folks and people of color and queer people of color? Or is it something completely different? This is something that I'm actually trying to work through in my work um, as a mental, as a black queer person of faith and a mental health provider. I hope that made sense. That was a lot of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who would like to answer that? Um, I will comment very, brief, very briefly. So when I talked about tapping into our own traditions, burning sage is not just for fun. Burning sage is real. Going to Miss Susie's and sitting down with Miss Susie and having a conversation, and Miss Susie fixes you a cup of tea, and that tea helps you deal with what's going on in your body, is healing. So we can use the skills and tools that are ours traditionally, that some would call non traditional, to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we can access what is good and useful, like a therapist that is really well-trained and skilled in working with us on our stuff, not just any old therapist who doesn't understand us and is not interested in us. That's doing more damage. Right. But that requires a community that will stand with you and help guide you to the right spaces. So the support mechanisms have to come from us as well. So I think that the church, as you say, and communities that really do understand our health and our challenges and our traumas and can do the work that serves us best is what we need. And so I know that City of Refuge is a space where massage therapy and Reiki and various other ways to deal with what's going on toxic in us is available, but we must replicate this. Um, and be really seriously spiritual and really seriously connected in ways that are our tradition. 
Anybody else? Yes. Yes, sir. I would say um, I think it's dangerous to over over conflate uh, mental health and the soul, but there is certainly an overlap. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, and what I tell people often is that within my lifetime, I've seen queer people fight to join the army. I've seen queer people fight to get married. But when it came to our souls, we just walked out. Come on now. Wow. Right? And so my concern, as much as I support a black exodus mm -hmm. or a queer exodus, my concern is where are we exiting to? Mm -hmm. Are we right. just exiting to the wilderness? It seems like a lot of us are spending a lot of time uh, exiting into the wilderness. And that's, that's my fear. Then what do we get in the wilderness? We can't just abandon our mental health. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so... Um, I want to see us create that fight within the black church mm -hmm. or within some type of um, mm -hmm. black institution or organization where we're starting to address what's happening, not only in our mental health, mm -hmm. but within our spirits. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, and somebody could pick it back off of what I'm about to say. I think with, just to pick it back off of some of what's already been said, what if we could use Exodus Day, mm -hmm. and I'm already giving it a name, mm -hmm. the Exodus Day as a day for mental health. Some, I know that there's a church in, in Chicago called Willow Creek, mm -hmm. and they do leadership simulcasts over a whole weekend. Mm -hmm. And they simulcast to thousands of churches around the world. CORE could simulcast to as many LGBT sensitive churches around the world mm -hmm. just on mental health issues, which would allow LGBT people to actually exodus, protest, and even possibly give withhold, not God help me, I'm not talking about withhold tidings from any <laughs> pastor because I feel like God help me, not, okay. But I'm just saying that it's, it's, a, it's a possible point, you know, that you could actually organize uh, a day or a weekend that'll actually meet that goal, but not to the wilderness, That's you know, right. you're coming into a church that has a, a system, uh, uh, therapists that are set up, speakers that are set up to receive them. What do you think? Thought? I think that's hot. I think, I mean, I think, I guess the question for me is like, what is the reason that we have these institutions? For me, I think it, it, it forces me to question the why. When I had my church uh, in New York City, I, I remember that my board being furious because every Sunday I would, I would stand up and I would say, if you're here every Sunday, I'm doing something wrong. And my folks were like, wait, you're messing with tithes and offerings. <laughs> but what I meant by that is if, if we're doing this thing right, there's going to be some Sundays that you're going to go to a spa, that you're going to experience God at the park. I mean, there's some Sundays that you're going to actually see that actually my spirit is calling me to do something else. And that's a beautiful thing. And I guess what, I, what I'm curious about, though, is how do we create churches or how do we create the assemblies of God that are actually about community? That's what the churches were supposed to be. It's like the assemblies of God, the place where we are actually, where we see justice making. And the reason that black churches were created is because we were not accepted and allowed to be in white denominations that were harming us. And so we created new institutions, new places to worship and commune with the infinite, with God itself. And so I wonder if there's a spirit of, if we're seeing some anxiety in these spaces, what if God is calling forth an action that creates something that is movement, that allows us to be more of who we know ourselves to be. Amen. So I don't think it's exiting to the wilderness, but I actually think that maybe the wilderness allows us to experience something that allows us to see what that next thing can be. It would I'm take, curious about yeah, that. I'm curious about it too. It would take strategy and logic and a lot of leadership yeah. and a lot of organizations to make that happen. Go ahead, Bill. I just wanted to make two points. One is I know the hour is late, but yes, that's sir. not one of the points. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is late. It is late. Okay, so uh, just qu quickly that we've done this before. I remember in the 1990s when I was living in Los Angeles and they called me to go to church, certain churches because the pastor wouldn't bury the person yeah. who died of AIDS because they had a AIDS diagnosis. And so the only person that would bury that person was uh, Bishop, Archbishop Carl Dean. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they were, you couldn't put it, anywhere in the program and no matter if you were a member a member of that church forever you know West Angeles I mean any church you couldn't be there you couldn't be buried there and so we had to change the national narrative and discourse on HIV and AIDS and we had to do it for ourselves and so this is something that we've done for ourselves before I'm not I'm not a clinician I'm not suggesting that our churches become places 
that where we have in-house clinicians, clinicians, although I think that's great, there should be that, but I do think it's important that we change the national, the narrative within the black church on the need and for mental health support. As my brother said, get, if you need external support, to me, that's spiritual, that's powerful, and take your meds and go to church. The other point I want to make is that as I experience God, sometimes it's within four walls. More often than not, it's on a hike. Or it's by the ocean, and that's where I'll go on Sundays. Or it's with a group of friends at brunch. Or it happens at somebody's house in the morning or in the afternoon. And so I spirit shows up for me in places where we gather and we are not doing church proper. But there is something that happens organically that I know for certain that it is divine, that the presence of God is right there in that space mm -hmm. with us. And I don't think we should discount that. And so, yes, change the institution, but I also think that we have to value those times that we come together and we are affirmed and we see God show up. I'll, I'll tell you this. I was getting ready to leave seminary uh, a year and a half in. I felt like it was too hard for me. And Dr. Dorsey Blake, seated right there, uh, he said, let me talk to you for a second. He said, I'm, I'm a man of peace. He said, but if I ever again hear that you are thinking about leaving a uh, seminary and you don't come talk to me first, mm -hmm. he says, I'll show you another side of me. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, that was a spiritual moment because somebody held me up when nothing else would. And I think that we have to become that for one another. All right. Uh, yes, Dr. Kid Hendry. You know, thank you. This is a, a fascinating, very fascinating discussion. <coughs> um, and when you raise the notion of <coughs> uh, spirituality, uh, it raised some questions for me and some observations. Um, one thing is that we don't do, I don't see done any widespread basis in the church at all, is uh, 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 try to arrive at an understanding or a definition of what spirituality really is. That's right. Um, you know, um, and you, you know, we conflate emotionality mm -hmm. with spirituality <laughs> and blame anything that happens on the spirit. You know, right, right, um, right. Um, and and our churches, like Brother Bernard is talking about uh, the spiritual. The, s the places he experiences God um, out in the world, and that's and that's very real. But since you know, we do have these churches, um, we should be able to experience to have spiritual experiences in, in the church as well. I've had I've had almost none in my life, and I'm 63. Um, but so I guess one question is. Another observation is we don't have a tradition of interiority in our churches. I mean, no, 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 if we have a, a moment of meditation, it's just to give the pastor time, you know, to get to the back so he can <laughs> shake hands. Um, and e even we talk about meditation sometimes. Folks talk about, well, that's that, that's all, that old Eastern stuff. And uh, yoga even is supposed to be from, from the devil and all that. So, so I guess the, the whole point I'm, 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 uh, I'm raising here is that when Rodney talks about talks about uh, self care, and we talk about mental mental health, I guess I'm I'm saying this and asking at the same time, how can we make our how can we make real spiritual experiences normative? In, in, in the black church, or can that happen? Are we too far gone for that to happen? Now, you know, we, we, can, we, you know, we can celebrate and we can have fun and call a church and all that. We know we can do that. But can we have moments of, inter of, of uh, internalization, you know, of, 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 of meditation, for instance, and we can commune with, with, with God for real instead of, you know, people coughing and saying, oh, that's the spirit moving. You know, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Is we blame the spirit for everything. So that's a question. Can we and how can we do that? Because if we don't do that, 
churches just really just end up being a, a, another kind of social club. Sure. Yeah. You know, sure. And Dr. 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 Andrew, you, 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 meant, you asked the question, you know, what does spirituality look like? And right. one of the things that I have grown to know and to, in response to your broader question, to me what it looks like is it's simply surrender. Surrender to the living and loving God. And as Rodney shared about having the courage to say, I'm not going to go to church this Sunday. I, I might be a faithful person, but I'm going to trust that I'm going to hear from God elsewhere. And that's part of my surrender. And, 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 and really, specifically what it looks like, it's the prayer of God increase in me as I decrease. And I like to even think of, of uh, and, and this is what, something that I, I, I use for myself, a visualization, is myself simply being prostrate on an ocean. And the divine is that ocean. And what I'm called to do is not stay on that surface and just get rocked and turned and so forth, but to sink, to dissipate to the bottom where it's still. And there is where I find clarity, and I find peace, and I find direction. And that is such a scary place because we, we are so caught up in a humanistic way of spirituality that in order for us to have church, we got to have, you know, this needs to be in place, that needs to be in place, and this needs to be in place. And, and can we get away from all of that for a while, just walk away, just walk away, and just simply say, God, I want you to increase as I decrease. Because, yes, yoga is good, but yoga is not for everybody. Going to the mountains is wonderful. But that, you know, God doesn't speak to everyone at the mountains or at the ocean and so forth. And so where do you go? And I think it's, it's this mental and spiritual place of just saying, I need to be still before God. Mm -hmm. And I need to just simply listen. I need to be open. That is not my wisdom, but it's God's wisdom to say, what is it that you're calling me to do? Mm. And once you then receive that clarity, it may be incredibly difficult, but I know how I know when it's God's will and God's working and not my own voice in my head is that when I'm given the courage and the tools to do that impossible task. Because that's God's yearning to say, go and talk. Go and change. Go and fix. And those are the things, and having those types of conversation and uh, developments that I think God uses, that, that when we are that surrender vessel, if you will, that God can do all kinds of incredible things. And I believe that is what we as um, queer people of faith and, and particularly uh, PLC queer folks, that's where we need to get to. And I, and I believe that is an exodus we can have without even leaving the space. It's, it's, it's within, it's, 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 it's leaving our own anxieties and our anger and our resentments and just saying, you know, I, let me surrender that or even surrender what I don't know and just simply be open to you, oh God, and see what the Spirit of God will do through the vessel of, 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 of ourselves. what we can do individually. I'm talking about how we can make that part of uh, a normative part of, mm -hmm. of, of community mm -hmm. and, and communal, communal worship. Yeah. Right. So that has to do maybe with liturgy. I, I, I'll be honest like with you. I, I, I still say the same answer. Because before well, we I, get to the place of community and everything, I, I, I think it is getting to a place of um, being on that same page that what is a particular strategy of this type, type of action? And, and to me, all, all I'm saying is whether you're talking about an indivi individual or collective, I, I still feel it's, it's mm. something that we oftentimes don't, do not do, which is simply surrender ourselves and say, okay, God, like, how do we do this? Because we have all talked about some very high and lofty things here. 
how does that happen? And I believe the reason why each of us have that particular vision is because that's been implanted not only in our minds, but in our spirits. And we see this vision of what can happen and what will happen. And that's what I believe, that's where it comes from. And that God gives the individual to speak to the mass. And, and that the mass also hears that vision and hopefully is also inspired. Uh, Zan, go ahead and chime in real quick. Yeah, I was just going to sort of uh, push back on, I noticed a lot of us were naming places we feel spiritual experiences as being very individual things. Mm -hmm. And I think what the church offers, what I feel like you were getting at, is this communal experience where our faith has to be shaped in community. Mm -hmm. um, and I worry about the ways that um, making overly important these personal experiences feeds into this very American notion of individual and personal salvation. And in addition, a real like lack of accountability. I've led a lot, I've met a lot of queer spiritual people who have left the church, who I'm like, what are the tenets of this spirituality? Because what I see is you treating people horribly. And not to say that people in the church don't, but it's, it's difficult to have a spiritual accountability. Um, and so I see the ways that those uh, faiths and spirituality really flourish when they're met with different and even um, differing opinions that can't necessarily always just come from our personal um, you know thoughts and processes and I really worry about um, I think you know salvation is very much about a personal salvation and about a community social justice, Absolutely. which our black churches were you know founded in and very good in, and I worry about you know tipping that scale too far into the American personal salvation side. Awesome, we got two questions on the floor back here, and then we'll come up here. I'll take them quick. <laughs> well, actually, the correction, he had a question before I had one, but I, he let me ask my question first. Yes, sir. So. Um, <coughs> I'm a big supporter of this mass exit. <laughs> and, um, but the question, a couple questions that come up for me is, when you do this mass exit, as uh, Roland just alluded to, where do they go? Because I think the thing is that a lot of times there is some, I believe that there is some internal homophobia and they just kind of like sit there and they just kind of just take in and they think that's what they deserve. But I also think that that, that the, the culture of church in which we were raised in, that to leave that culture, that, that type of experience, and come to an affirming church, even like City Refuge, even though we do have a Pentecostal Baptist, Baptist experience, but, but some of the other churches, you don't have that. But if you are rooted and grounded in a certain culture and tradition of worship and praise, to leave that has nothing to do with me thinking about how I, feel, how I view God and me or the pastor. It's that experience. Uh -huh. So then how do you help them to go from that culture, that experience, that reality, and realize that you can still experience God, as somebody on the stage also alluded to, about getting a true spirituality, a true understanding of who God is for you, not from this tradition, not from this culture. You look so puzzled. No, I'm, I'm no. loving it. I'm thinking it through. I actually, I'm getting excited. So the, the, the crime of a, a theology that says that we're less than human is that many of us who were called to preach and called to teach will not teach and not preach. Mm -hmm because we have accepted a theology that we're less than human. That's James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's a piece of it. I actually think it would be an interesting process, a strategy, to look at all the affirming space, all the affirming churches across the country. Mm -hmm. Excuse, excuse me, let me be clear. Black, people of color, affirming, like, welcoming churches. I want to know where they all are, like all of them. Because actually, I think there are many places that people could exit to. Um, and I actually think it would be interesting to think about what are the new spaces that we actually need to, where, what are the cities and locations where we can actually create new institutions, new churches that are justice making churches that actually have space where people shut up mm -hmm. for a moment mm -hmm. and meditate mm -hmm. and dig deep and go within mm -hmm. together as a community. I really hear you. And so I'm wondering, because I actually think that there's so many seminaries, like we are, we are 
we are graduating lots of folks with MDivs, and there's not that many churches available for them to preach, which I actually think that's an opportunity Absolutely. to create new spaces and new Absolutely. cities that are justice-making, affirming, liberative, powerful, radical spaces, because I know there's enough churches where we can house them because no one's in them and they're closed, but we, we could create these spaces. But I think this is a strategy. I mean, this would be a strategy conversation because mm -hmm. I think we could think city by city how to create those spaces, how to help people exit and go into someplace else. And there are some places that they don't have to exit for long. Mm -hmm. Like actually, if we didn't show up one Sunday, like things would shift mm -hmm. because right. it would have an impact yeah. mm -hmm. and people would see it. Yeah. But I think it's a bigger, I think it's a longer, it's like a strategy conversation that we could take seriously and think through. And let me say that very quickly, that the depth of spiritual connection and meeting God or meeting the divine, that, that's part of that thing that draws us to these spaces that aren't welcoming. We don't have to leave that behind when we go to new spaces. So what I would say is a deeper connection to what's really, truly spiritual and really transformative and to really lift that up as opposed to that which is false, phony, and fake yeah. mm -hmm. and does not serve us. Mm -hmm. That's real. And that would be translatable to spaces that are quote unquote traditional spaces because the real truthfulness of that is undeniable. We know when we're really connected, yeah. and we know when we're not. <laughs> and the truth of that, Bishop says that our witness is the presence of the divine among us. Mm -hmm. It's undeniable. So we walk into spaces, and we queer them, and the spirit shows up, and folks are like, what happened? Daryl Coley's funeral, what happened? Jesus. That the spirit came in so powerfully from these bodies that we often reject. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, truth happened. Right. <laughs> and it was undeniable. Amen. Amen. The, uh, the other part, real quick, yes, which um, Cedric just hit on, was that I think it's important that we reconsider our God view and help people while they're in these spaces to start reframing yes. how they see God, how they view God, Amen. and how they think God views them. Because that's the only way, in my opinion, that that, that exiting, whether they stay there or that internal exiting, is going to take place. Because that God view is the thing that blocks everything. Go ahead, Brother Eric. After Brother Eric, we're going to bring back this, this brother's been waiting a while, okay? I want to return us to the, the, the activism question, if I might. Um, and to Brother Cedric's comment that, that people of color are invisibilized in the movement. And I want to make sure that we like name and not take for granted like what is the movement yeah, that you're talking real. about. Mm -hmm. And so particularly as we're thinking about HRC and the National LGBT Task Force, I mean, are we still in this place where um, a, a gay liberation movement still assumes a white male heteros, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, middle class, et cetera, uh, kind of subject? And if that's true, then might we also be suspicious of the National Ac Action Network mm -hmm. and the NAACP where we're still trying to, I mean, we're invisible in, in lots, of, mm -hmm. lots of spaces. And yeah. so I know that that's a big question, but the, for, for, for the recording, for those of us who yeah. want to uh, be the agents of God's justice, even at local levels, how do we, how do we select mm -hmm. the kind of activism and the kind of organizations to anchor into? Mm -hmm. So I want, yes, I was going to say black right there. Black Lives Matter is so black <laughs> right and so clear. <laughs> yes! <laughs> right there. Yeah. That's, that's all I had to say. Real and the other thing I was just going to exactly. say is that from the inside looking out, it is very white. And, and let me make no mistake, it is uh, to the degree of white supremacy within the LGBT community. Preach. And that's just the truth. That is just the truth. And we have to understand that many of the donors that fund these organizations are themselves white, wealthy, gay, 
men. And so there's a degree of investment in misogyny, sexism, and uh, male dominance and patriarchy. So what I, I think we just need to say that and understand that's where we're working from. The question then becomes, do I step away from this table and do I go then to the NACP where they'll take recognize my ethnicity, but they don't want to talk about my sexuality? Absolutely. Or do I then go to the National Action Network that says I recognize it, but you have to do the work, which I say, yes, I'll do the work. I'll find the folks. I know, I know Bishop Flynn and other folks who could help us do it. So I don't know that there's a perfect place for us to go. I believe this. It's a matter of calling. And I, 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 where I am, I see it as a form of ministry. And I don't want to make this about me, but I think it's what the work that we do. If it, re if it resonates with us, yeah, that's right. it is a form of discernment for me. Mm -hmm. Because on, on the inside, it is straight up battle every single day. And I need to go to my colleagues and my friends and my sisters and brothers and bristers and say, help me and affirm, affirm that I'm, I'm on the battlefield. And then push me back out there to do it some more. And it's not about being a martyr, but it's just being real. That's what we're dealing with. Amen. Preach. Amen. This is our brother up here. First of all, I want to say there is a precedent for what you're saying in terms of coming out of churches. In the 19th century, there was a come out of movement, mm -hmm. asking people to come out of churches that supported slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, the church is an institution mm -hmm. and will respond to the economic realities yes, of losing true. money. Mm -hmm. um, but the other th question I want to raise is how willing are we to risk ourselves? Yes. Mm -hmm. Our own comfortability, our mm -hmm. own familiarity yes. with mm -hmm. forms of worship. Yes. Um, we do have at Fellowship Church a time of meditation is central to our church services. Mm -hmm. There are people who come there who've been uncomfortable with initial. We have some church members that the first time I came, you had that meditation thing. I really didn't like that. I was really uncomfortable. Uh, and it's guided meditation with different forms. And there's a fellow now, he's our vice president, who said that one of the reasons he comes to the church is for that. Mm -hmm. He says, when I was a child, my father used to say to me all the time, boy, you need to learn how to be still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it there is a stillness, mm. and it's one of the things I miss and have a real problem with when I go to so many conventions, and there is shouting, preaching after preaching, shouting, and, and there's no time for me to go and to myself. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I want to just say in terms of our church services and how we motivate people, people are motivated by things other than the Bible. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to incorporate more of that into our service you were talking today, Dr. Hendricks, about the fact, literature. You mentioned James Baldwin. Yeah. Why can't you make the Baldwin in a church That's service? Right. It might hit somebody that, that um, the gospel of Mark never will hit. Yeah. I heard last night uh, Towns, um, and it was beautiful. I said, the poetry she read. It reminded me of Margaret Walker. For my people, we have been believers. We have used that in our church services. So it's a matter of our own, I think, at times, moving out of our own sense of being comfortable, mm -hmm. and this is the way the service needs to go and needs to proceed. Yeah. I remember my own struggle, one of the things that helped me when I had my own struggle against the church was reading poetry. The 19th Amendment helped me to understand a lot about my own situation. Mm -hmm. The Indian poet Tagore speaks mm -hmm. to my soul. Mm -hmm. And so it's this kind of being, I think, ourselves willing to Go where our spirits are leading us. Yes. Because it's only as we relax ourselves into the deep mystery yes. that we will find in the universe the kinds of resources that we need to do what we've got to do. Yes. And we'll find the resources that will support us in our doing. But it's our own willing to, to let go of the things that incarcerate us in many ways. Come on now. Mm -hmm. In search for that ultimate understanding, that, that wholeness yes. that we need, that, that hunger of the heart that Thurman talked mm -hmm. about to find connection mm -hmm. yeah. with each other and with all of life. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Awesome. Yes, go ahead. I, I, just, I just want to offer, like, there were three things that transformed my church and made it into a community. One thing was is that my preach, I cut my preaching to 20 minutes, mm -hmm. nice. and then I set a mic up so that someone could respond. <laughs> And so someone could come up right after and yeah. say, here's what I heard. Mm -hmm. And this is how it affects, this is what I'm struggling with right here and right now. 
first Sunday I did this, I will never forget it. Someone stood up and said, you know what, Pastor, this week I got tested and I was tested positive for HIV. Mm -hmm. And I thought this meant that God, this is what God, I thought this was God's way of saying I was wrong. And I think what you're telling me is, this is what I think I heard, that I'm not wrong. Mm. First Sunday, change the church, right? So having less, like less me performing mm -hmm. <laughs> or preaching, and then actually having it as a conversation, having a moment of conversation transform the church. The second thing is we meditated together, five to seven minutes together, and it was powerful. The third thing was is that I actually got, I stopped obsessing with the church tithing and started, I mean, people tithing to the church and started obsessing on who the church was tithing to. Mm -hmm. And by the church tithing and actually announcing who we tithe, it made it a community because we brought in community groups who said, this is what we're doing in the church, do, uh, what we're doing in the world. And people tithe to that. Mm -hmm. And then once a quarter, the church tithed back to its members who had dreams and visions for their lives. It transformed the church. Mm -hmm. But the reason, the, the question for me is, what's the purpose of church? Mm -hmm. Like, why are we doing it? And if that's, if our obsession is the why, we can create those moments to do what you're talking about that creates community or that creates where people have an experience that is beyond Sunday, right? That they can take into their lives Monday through, fr th through Saturday as well. Amen. Well, it is 10 minutes, seven minutes to five. We are a little bit over time, but I believe the presence of the Lord was here. The conversation and dialogue <laughs> was hot, as you said. And I am your girl, Kelly Lee, from SAF TV. Put your hands together one more time as we close the session out. Come on, Reverend Dr. Stringfellow. spectacular time of both mind, body, and spirit, and we're so very grateful that you have been with us, and we do hope you'll be back tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have breakfast um, from um, beginning at 7.30 uh, until 9. I, actually, I think it may, may be slightly different tomorrow, but if you come at 8, let's say 8. It's at 8. It's at 8, yeah. From um, 8 to 9, we'll, we'll provide breakfast again. Um, Cedric said something uh, at the very beginning of our morning that we wanted